We live in a world where artificial is normal and authentic is rare. Fake news, fake politicians, fake causes, fake relationships, and sadly fake religion are our reality. But not only is this true in our day, this was also true when James challenged believers in that day to live out an authentic faith. What he wrote was more than just a collection of stories. It was and is the living, breathing Word of God. It helps us to know Jesus more intimately, and it shows us what it looks like to live out our faith as citizens of Jesus' kingdom. Artificial faith never truly changes a person's life and certainly doesn't change a person's eternal destiny. The Bible calls us to abandon the fake and embrace the authentic. All right, so I got a question to ask everyone as we, we start off today. Have you ever had someone that comes to you for advice? They always come to you to ask you your opinion and what you think they should do in certain situations. And then when you tell them what, they th- what you think and you give them the advice, they never do what you, you say or they never take your advice. But they always keep coming back saying, well, hey, what do you think about this? And then you tell them, like, hey, here's my advice, here's what I think, and then they just completely ignore it and do the opposite. Anybody ever experienced that in your life? And like, yep, I, I have. I've probably been that person, uh, and probably at some point all of us have been that person. Uh, but as we continue in our series called Authentic Faith through the book of James, that's kind of exactly what we're going to be talking about today. You know, how that makes us feel when we, we think about it. it. Just Let's be honest, that really torques us when we continually give our advice to people and they just kind of blow it off and ignore it. And, and that really irritates us. But let's think about this for a moment. How often are we guilty of doing the exact same thing when it comes to God and His Word? We go to the Lord seeking His wisdom, as we talked about last week, seeking wisdom when we're enduring trials and when we're facing temptations. But yet, how often do we go to God's Word and we seek God's wisdom and we get the advice we need and we figure out what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to handle the situation, but yet we ignore it? How often are we guilty of that? Let's just be real today. We're we're guilty of that an awful lot. And so when we think about Scripture, we have been given the very blueprint that is necessary for living the life that Christ has called us to live. Yet, you and I so often are guilty of failing to obey the Word and to live out what it actually says. And in fact, James chapter uh, 1, verses 19 through 27, which is where we're going to be today, gives us a journey and describes for us a journey of obedience. And it deals with how you and I are to respond to the truth of God's Word. And, and, And I thought about that when it came to you know, giving advice and, and being the one asking for advice. There's been a lot of times in my life, I'm sure, that I've asked people what they think, and then when they tell me what they think or they give me their advice, I'm like, nah, I don't think so. You know, and it's kind of like, you do that enough, and it's kind of like the person begins to, well, why are you even asking me? It's kind of like you've got your mind made up already. And, and I'm afraid too often we treat God's Word that way when we approach His Word, is that we're seeking wisdom. We're saying, okay, God, what do you want to, to say to me and how do I need to handle this situation or what do I need to do in this circumstance? And then yet we fail to act upon God's word. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in James chapter 1 verses 19 through 27 is what it looks like to act on the word of God and acting on God's word. And so I want us to remember this statement as we journey through this passage today. And it is this. Our faith must be more than a profession. It must be acted on. Our faith must be more than a profession. It must be acted on. In fact, we're going to deal with that in a couple of weeks when James says that faith without works is dead or it is useless or worthless. And and so having a profession of faith, and that's what a lot of people have done, is they've made professions of faith, but yet they really have not acted on that faith. And James is going to talk about the difference in just a mere profession, and actually living out our faith. And so let's jump into our text today. But um, I said we're covering verses 19 through 27, but we're going to start in verse 16. I know we read through that last week, but for context's sake, I believe it's important for us to include verses 16, 17, and 18 in 
our passage today as we journey through the end of chapter 1. So let's begin reading in verse 16. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless, and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, in the passage we just read, James is echoing Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, The passage we just read is going to be an echo specifically from Matthew chapter 7 as Jesus is wrapping up his Sermon on the Mount. And I want you to listen to the words of Jesus and think about the words we just read in James. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. He says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Now, I don't know about you, but I really love that song we sang just a little bit ago. He knows my name. And I'm thankful that he knows my name because that's what's important is that he knows me. Those are the scariest words that I think we could ever hear uttered is depart from me. I never knew you. And Jesus says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, even those that call him Lord, He's saying not every one of them will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, but only the one who does the will of my Father. So again, there's a connection between action and and faith and and, and what we believe. And so we see that James is going to echo that, that he's saying we need to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. In fact, Jesus goes on to to continue in, in Matthew 7 and verse 24. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. Now notice what what Jesus is saying here. He says that the people that that hear his words, the people that hear his words and act on them, he's saying those people are going to, uh, these are, are wise people. They have built their house on the foundation upon my teaching and what I have said. He's saying the people that hear the words and don't do them, they're they're like foolish people because they've heard what I've taught and yet they failed to act on them and to do what they say or what he says. And so James is echoing Jesus' teachings here. He's literally writing to this group of Jewish Christians that, as we talked about last week, were scattered because of persecution. And he's concerned that their lack of obedience to God's word is actually an indication that they might not really be in the faith. And James is going to deal with that. As we talked about uh, last week, and as the, the, the sermon bumper video talks about, that you know we live in a world of fake and artificial. 
And James is all about telling us what it looks like to have a real and authentic faith. And so true faith in Jesus, when we have that, always results in a changed life that is reflected by our actions. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect. Let's just, let's just you know, get that out of the way. We're not going to be perfect. Uh, and, and so often the world looks at us and they think that we have this idea that we're perfect because we're Christians. And if you're truly a believer in Jesus, you know that is completely untrue. Because if you know anything about Jesus and you've been a Christian at any length of time, you know that we are far from perfect. In fact, we are just as jacked up and broken and messed up as anybody else. And we have the same struggles as anyone else. And we have not yet arrived. But it also means that we are striving to be more like Jesus every day. We're not always going to hit the mark. In fact, most days I fail miserably at trying to look like Jesus because in my own power, I can't do it. I have to have the Holy Spirit to live the life of Jesus through me. And there are a lot of days that I I fail miserably. In fact, I fail more than I succeed in that area. But my desire and your desire as believers should be that we look like Jesus and we reflect Jesus in our lives. And so that's what James is writing about, saying that he's really concerned that their lack of obedience and their lack of action when it comes to God's word is indicating they might not really be believers. And so he's writing to them about the importance of acting on God's word. So let's jump in and look at what we just read and let's, let's share a few things about practically what it looks like and, and as we think about acting on God's word. Number one, acting on God's word, uh, we must humble ourselves so that our hearts are open to receiving what God's Word says. We must humble ourselves so that our hearts are open to receiving what God's Word says. See, we, ha- we are to hear God's Word with humility and meekness, meaning that we should humbly be willing to receive the Word. And in fact, he even says that uh, in, in the verses we read, that we are to humbly receive the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. Meaning that we receive God's word in a spirit of humility, not not puffed up, not arrogant, not prideful, not defensive. But our default reaction, let's be real today, is is this. and, and, And this is my default reaction too. Is often to be defensive and to justify my lack of obedience to God's word. And if you're being truthful today, that's your default reaction a lot of times when we read certain things. There's certain things we read and we're like, yes, we we agree with that. Hey, we have eternal life. Jesus has paid our sin debt. We we have freedom in Christ. We celebrate and we we cheer those things. But then when it says, forgive uh, the person who's hurt you, then we're like, well, I don't know about that, Jesus. Uh, Yeah, you you don't really know them. You don't know what they did. And, or it says to, to love your enemies, to do good to those who would despitefully use you and persecute. Well, yeah, I, I know, but, you know. Um, and, and we start justifying uh, whenever it comes to, to whatever it may be. That's our default reaction. But humility is a must if God's Word is going to flourish in our lives. We must be humble when we read God's Word, when we hear God's Word. We have to open our hearts to, being, to receive what he wants us to receive. We have to humble ourselves to do that. It means we can't think we've arrived. And that was the Pharisees' problem. They thought they were so spiritual, they didn't need what Jesus was offering. And too many times, I'm afraid, in our church culture today, we are so spiritual that we, we think that is not for us, but it's for someone else. And when we hear the words preached, we're like, oh, well, yeah, I, how many, I just thought of this, and I, I've done this before. I'll admit it. How many of us, we've been sitting in church and we've heard in the worship gathering, we've heard something preached and, and you instantly think, you're looking around, man, I wish that person was here today. They needed to hear that. Oh, yeah. How many times have you thought, I've been guilty. I thought, man, man, they should have been here. They really needed that message today. And, and sometimes we do it maliciously. Sometimes we really don't do it maliciously, but let's just be real. Even in our good intentions, instead of that, we should be like, man, I don't know, man, I really needed that today. But, you know, how many times are we guilty of that because we're not humble about it? And so humility is a must. And so here's the thing I know, that we're never going to win the battle against sin in our lives without humbling ourselves. We're never going to have victory over sin and struggles in our life if we're not humble. If we're arrogant and we think we've got it all together and we think we've arrived, we are going to struggle with sin because we're not going to see ourselves as sinful. We're not going to see ourselves as 
and needing God's mercy and needing God's grace. And thus, we're not going to extend mercy and grace because we're going to think we deserve, we, you know, we deserve it and we don't deserve it. We're never going to win the battle if we don't humble ourselves. And so James says that you're to humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Number two, <clears throat> there is a difference between hearing and listening. There is a difference between hearing and listening. In fact, James says that, uh, and this is one of those verses when I read, I go, I'm not, go, I'm not cheering, going, yay, Lord, that's right. You tell them. I read it and I'm going, oh, man, man, I am not doing well with that one. But in James, he said in, in verse 19, we see, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. When I read that, I'm thinking, oh my, oh yeah, okay. But there's a difference between hearing, hearing and listening. He doesn't say we should be quick to hear. He says we should be quick to listen. Hearing means to listen to, to give or pay attention to. And they're very similar, but here's the difference. Hearing means that you listen, you give attention or pay attention to, but listen means this. You're to pay attention, heed, obey. So there's a big difference. See, here's the thing. We can hear something without really listening to it. It's kind of like those of you who teach school, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you're teaching and you're telling the kids. There's a lot of kids, they're hearing you. They're not listening to you. In fact, I, I can remember that. I, I used to hear my teachers all the time fuss at me for not doing my homework. I wasn't really listening to them because I never, I, I never really did my homework. And so I'd hear them. I heard everything they said, but it was like, yep, okay, you know, in one ear and out the other. And, and so that's what James is saying. He says we're to be quick to listen, meaning that we're to pay attention to with the idea that we're going to heed it and obey what we are listening to. And so there are three things that he talks about in that verse. He says we're to be quick to listen. And so what does that mean? It means quick to pay attention to what God's Word says and be ready to obey and live it out. So we're to quick to, to listen to the Word of God, to what God is saying to us, but not just so we're hearing it, but we're to be quick to listen so that when we do hear the Word, that we immediately act upon it. And that in humility, we're like, oh, wow, okay, i got to work on that. Oh, wow, yeah, I, I need some attention to, to my, that area of my life. It means I'm ready to obey, and I'm ready to say, okay, God, you know, I'm struggling with this right now. I'm having issues right now. I'm, I'm wanting to, to be fast to speak instead of quick to listen. But then he says, slow to speak. And let's be real. We live in a culture where people speak before they really think about what they're saying. If you, you don't believe that, just watch, just watch people on TV. Whether it be celebrities, whether it be people in the news, whether it be people in politics, whether it be whatever, it doesn't matter. People are quick to open their mouths and offer their opinions. And the Bible, and I, I tell you, Proverbs has a lot of great wisdom to talk about this very thing. And it's really important that we are slow to speak. A quick response is not always the right response. And the older I'm getting, the more I'm learning this. Um, I joke with people all the time. You know, being a pastor in my 30s, taking you know, at the time pastoring for the first time, not really knowing what I was doing, I was really quick to speak. Um, I didn't mind telling someone what I thought after they told me what they thought. Uh, I was really quick to offer my evaluation on the situation. I was quick to offer a response to things. Uh, I would tell people in my 30s I could be a bull in a china shop, and I didn't care because I was going to tell you what I thought. And the older I'm getting, I'm learning that a quick response is not always the right response because often when it's a quick response, we're responding in the moment without really processing. And so Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13, I read that this just this morning. The one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness and disgrace for him. The one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness and disgrace for him. You know, the problem we have in our culture is that we, even when we're technically listening, what we're doing is we're listening to respond. It's the whole time, and I've been guilty of this, I'm listening to someone, and the whole time as they're talking, I'm listening, thinking, okay, how am I going to respond to what they just said? 
And so if I'm doing that, I'm not really listening to what they're saying. In fact, I'm thinking the whole time about my response. And what James is saying, we need to be slow to speak. We need to be quick to listen, meaning that when someone's talking and and they're sharing their story or we're listening to their point of view or their perspective, truly listen to what they're saying. And, and, And we need to be the same way with God. When we're reading God's word and God's word is speaking to us or we're hearing God's word proclaimed and we're listening, we need to be quick to listen and slow to respond. We need to just let it kind of marinate. You know, anyone who, who grills out or, or especially if you like to smoke barbecue and things like that, you know a lot of times if you're, you're cooking a steak on the grill, you're going to marinate that thing first. And what happens is you let it sit in the marinade, usually overnight, and it marinates and that, that flavor saturates the meat. And, and it, just, it, it just increases the flavor. It's so much better. That's the way it should be with us in God's Word, is we should marinate in the Word of God and allow it to saturate us. As one of my mentors in ministry would say, his, his dad, who was a pastor, always used to say, the more the Word of God gets into us, the more it oozes out of us. And, and so that means that we allow it to just marinate in our minds and in our hearts, and we meditate on God's Word, and we kind of chew on it and, and think on it. But then he says also we're to be not only quick to listen, slow to speak, he says slow to anger. Now, this one, I'll be honest, for me, I read this, and this is one of those things where I'm not going, yay, Lord, yep, that's right. I'm going, yeah, okay, yeah. uh, um, I struggle with this, because let's just be, I'm going to tell you, like, especially I was struggling with it this morning, because I was driving up the road, and there was some idiot that cut me off, you know, you know that person that's in the left lane and they pass you and then it's like whoop, all the way over to turn. I was like, and I'm going, you idiot, you, you know. I'm, so I was not slow to anger. Um, but anger, he says we're to be slow to anger. Why? Because anger is damaging to the righteousness that God desires in us. In fact, it says that, he says, human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. And, and so it damages the righteousness of God, that God desires in us when we are quick to get angry. Because most of the time, our anger, it's not a righteous anger. When Jesus got angry and he chased the, the money changers out of the temple, it was a righteous anger because they were, they were extorting the people of God in the house of God, in the temple there, and they were extorting them in a place that was supposed to be a house of prayer. And so in righteous anger, he drove them from that place. But our anger really is not righteous. Let's just be real. Our anger is more self-focused because it just doesn't line up with what we want or we're not getting our way or or whatever it is. And it's usually to do with us and has less to do with God and God's glory. And so he says we're to be slow to anger. Why? Because as Peter tells us, we're to be holy as our Father in heaven is holy. And what that means is that we're to reflect God and God is slow to anger. He's abounding in mercy. He's faithful and, and steadfast in his love. And so, because God is, is slow to get angry, that means that we as Christians, as we should live out this aspect of God, this character of God, and be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry. One pastor friend says, there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. It's because we're to listen more than we're to speak. And in fact, scripture even talks about this, that the more words we say, and I'm I'm paraphrasing the verse because I don't remember it off the top of my head, but the more we talk, the more we're accountable. And the more we say, the more we have to give an account for. And it's kind of like, you know, you watch people on the, the TV sometimes who make these really horrible gaffes on TV and they make these, re- they say these really bad things accidentally. Um, and, and pastors are not immune from this too. The more we speak, we're bound to slip up and say something really dumb. And, and, and so he's, there's really wisdom in listening first, being slow to speak and slow to get angry. And so there is a difference between hearing God's word and listening to God's word. We're, we're told to be quick to listen because it indicates that there's action that follows the listening. Number three, hearing God's word and failing to act on it leads us to a place of deception. Hearing God's word and failing to act on it leads us to a place of deception. Deception. 
See, faith must be demonstrated. Faith is something to be lived out. And James is going to talk more about this in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to get into in the next couple of weeks. Only hearing the Word of God in our lives, when we only hear God's Word and we don't act on it, it it's of little use. It's kind of like just hearing something for the sake of hearing it or gaining knowledge. If we're only hearing it and we're not acting on it, God's Word is of little use in our lives because it's not changing us. It's not making us look more like Jesus. And so faith must be demonstrated. It must be acted on. See, it's all too easy for us to fall into this trap of thinking we are right with God and in a right relationship with Him just because we hear His Word. I think there's so many people in church culture today that think they're okay with the Lord because they, they show up week after week and they hear the Word, but yet their lives don't really reflect what they're hearing. There's not any change. You don't see God at work in their life and you don't see them being conformed to the image of Jesus. And it's easy for us to fall into that trap of thinking we're okay because we're hearing it. But as we said, there's a difference between hearing and listening. And so James is going to use this example of a man looking in a mirror, of a man, he says, who looks in a mirror and he looks intently and then he goes on his way after he looks and it says that he forgets what kind of man he is or what manner of man he is. And so James is using this example because he's saying that there's no real effect on this person's life. They kind of glance at themselves and then they just go on. It would be kind of like us thinking about we're getting ready in the mornings, we're, we're, you know, we're doing our routine, some of us you know, fixing hair, uh, you, know, you might be putting makeup on, whatever, and you're making sure you look just right. And you're looking at yourself in the mirror to make sure everything's in place, nothing's out of order. And then you go on your way. And then could you imagine if something, you know, like you never looked in the mirror again at all throughout the day. And maybe something had happened and you didn't realize it because you went on and you pretty much forgot about it. Um, he's saying that that's kind of what's going on here. There's no real effect on their, their life. There was a failure to respond to God's word. And because there was a failure to respond to God's word, they really forgot about their true condition. They forgot about their sinful condition because they weren't acting on God's word. They were, they were hearing it, and that was all they were doing. They weren't acting on it. And so they really forgot about what kind of people they were and who they were. And I think it can get easy in our lives. I know it can be for me, and, and I really thought about this, that it's really easy for me the more I hear the word of God proclaimed, if I don't listen to it, to act on it, it can be really easy for me to forget about who I really am. Um, it can be easy for me to forget about the sinful nature that lurks with inside me and the, and, and the things that I war against. It can be really easy for me to forget that when I don't hold this mirror up and evaluate myself. See, what I end up doing and what you end up doing is instead of holding up this mirror to ourselves and, and saying, okay, let's see what I really look like. We look at someone else and we go, oh, well, I might not be that great, but man, I'm not doing that. I, I'm not as bad as that person. Man, I, I, you know, hey, I'm, I know I'm struggling. I know I'm not perfect, but hey, I am nothing like that. And, and we say things like that. And we justify ourselves because of that. And, and when we fail to hold the mirror of God's word up to our lives, and we fail to respond, we forget who we really are and what we really are. And so if God's word has not made a change in our lives, what it means is then God's word has not truly entered our lives. If it's not changed us, then it's not truly in us. Because when God's word gets in us, it changes us and it makes us different. Again, it doesn't make us perfect, but it changes our desires and it changes our wants and and it's our desire to look more like Jesus and to reflect more of Jesus in our lives if his word has entered in our lives. But the one who is a doer of the word, James says, he says the one who hears the word and is not a doer, he says he's deceived. He says, but the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, he says, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, he says, who works. He says, this person will be blessed in what he does. And so the one who is a doer of the word, he is one that has allowed God's word to be implanted 
and to take root in his heart. And they li- as they live out the teachings of Jesus. So a doer of the word is simply someone who has allowed the word to be implanted in their heart, to take root, as we talked about last week, and in their heart as, as they live out the teachings of Jesus. And he says they're going to be blessed as they do this. Now, what that doesn't mean that, hey, you're going to be prospering financially. It doesn't mean, hey, your marriage is never going to have any issues. It doesn't mean all your kids are going to be perfect. It means Jesus is saying, you are blessed because you are a doer of the word. And he's saying, what you're doing will be blessed. But hearing God's word and failing to act on it leads us to a place of deception. It leads us deceived about who we really are. And it's important for us to never lose sight of who we really are because if we do that, then we we lose sight of our desperate need for God's grace in our lives every single day. Let me give you the fourth thing. Number four, a faith that does not influence our heart and actions is worthless. A faith that does not influence our heart and our actions is worthless. See, James describes pure religion as this. In fact, he says that in verse, um, here it is in, um, excuse me here, verse 26, he says, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, he says his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Then he goes on to say in verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. And here's what he says it is. He says, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So there are three things that James says as he describes pure religion. It's this, the control of our speech, acts of charity, and resisting temptation. That's what pure and undefiled religion looks like. So rash and angry speech... When we do that, he says literally is putting our faith in question. If we can't control our tongues, if we can't control our speech, and we're rash and we're angry about our speech, he's saying that's putting our faith into question because that is not pure and undefiled religion. He's saying that our religion is useless and we deceive ourselves if we can't control our tongues. And Proverbs, again, says a lot about this. It says fools give full vent to their anger. It it talks a lot about not giving vent to our anger, and it talks about controlling our tongues. In fact, James will even talk more about this too, that in the power, there's the power of death and life is, or is uh, death and life are in the power of the tongue, meaning that we can build up with our words or we can tear down with our words. One of the greatest illustrations I've seen of this was years ago, uh, a a a pastor had a, a tube of toothpaste and he had a paper plate. And he asked someone, he said, I need you to come up here for just a moment. He says, okay, squeeze all the toothpaste out on the plate. And so took a few moments and all the toothpaste was out on the plate. And he says, okay, great. Now put it back in the tube. And it's like, well, that's, that's not going to happen. That's, you can't. Once it's out, it's out. And that's the way it is with our speech. James is saying that when we say stuff, it's out there and we can't take it back. We can apologize, yes, but we can't ever change the fact that we said it. And so rash, angry speech puts our faith in question. Um, As Christians, we should not be angry people. We should be the most joyous people. Why? Because we have found eternal life in Jesus. We should be the most loving people. Why? Because God loved us at our lowest point. God loved us when we least deserved it. We should be the least angry people on the face of the planet. Why? Because we have experienced forgiveness and the goodness of God. And so he's saying rash and angry speech puts your faith in question. But then also he talks about acts of charity. He says that pure and undefiled religion is to care for the orphans and the the widows in their distress. God has a heart for the fatherless, for widows. The orphans and widows, if you read God's word, you will learn that God has a special place and has a heart for these groups of people. Listen to these words in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 18 and 19. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widows he lo- and loves the resident alien, giving him food and clothing. You are also to love the resident alien since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. And then he goes on in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. He says, learn to do what is good, pursue justice, 
Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. God had a lot to say in the law to Israel about how they were to care for those who could not care for themselves. Those who were oppressed. Those uh, who were foreigners in their land. God had a lot of things to say about how Israel was to care for them. And he says, especially he says, and he loves the resident alien. He says, uh, giving him food and clothing. And he says, you're also to love the resident alien since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. In the old King James, it says strangers, meaning that you are foreigners. You didn't belong there. And he's saying, because I showed you kindness in the land of Egypt, and because you were strangers there, and I looked after you, he says that you are to do the same for the strangers in your land that I'm bringing you into because of what I did for you. You're to do that for others. And so acts of charity is pure and undefiled religion. And let's just be real. The church has done really kind of a miserable miserable job in the last probably 20, 30, 40 plus years of us looking after orphans and widows. See, it's really easy for us to talk about pro-life and, 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 and being pro-life because we believe every person is created in the image of God and we believe life begins at conception because of Scripture. It's really easy for us to hold that stand, but how are we coming alongside that single mother who just found out she's pregnant and that's living in poverty? What are we doing to help her? How are we walking alongside of her? It's really easy to tell people what we stand for, but we must come alongside them and live out and demonstrate what we say we believe. And so we've got to come alongside and, and, and help people like that. Whether it's, it's orphans, whether it's people who are widows, we've got to come along and demonstrate acts of charity. But then the last thing he says is resisting temptation, meaning we're to keep ourselves unstained from the world. Now, what does that mean? keeping ourselves unstained from the world. It does not mean that we are to remove ourselves from the world. See, there's a lot of people that that teach that, you know, we're to keep ourselves from the world. So that means we isolate ourselves from the world. We don't have anything to do with the world. There's a lot of people that believe that, but that's not what that means. It means that we are to live in the world with intelligence and forethought to keep our life and our reputation and our faith pure. Meaning that, yes, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And we must live in the world. We cannot reach a world that we don't know and love. We can't reach a world that we're not rubbing shoulders with because Jesus himself demonstrated that when he ate with tax collectors and other sinners. In fact, Jesus hung out with some of the most scandalous people of his day, but yet he did not engage in their activity. In fact, he was was accused of being a friend of sinners. It doesn't mean that we remove ourselves from the world. It means that we act with intelligence. We live with forethought to keep our life and our reputation and our faith pure. It means it doesn't matter what the world around us does. It means we're going to live like Jesus has called us to live, and we're going to reflect Jesus' love to those around us. So let's wrap up. As followers of, of Jesus, when it comes to acting on God's Word... Here's, I love what David Nistrom says in the NIV application commentary on the book of James. I, I, I pulled this out because I love this statement. He says, James pleads with us to spend time in introspection and a careful and accurate gaze in the mirror of the word before we sally forth into the world to offer our ill-considered opinions in the name of Christ. Failure to do so can at times result in behavior that is unchristian and has the potential to harm others. Meaning that before we try to straighten out the world, we need to hold the mirror of God's Word up to ourselves and get an accurate gaze as to who we really are and to see who we are in light of God's Word. It's really easy for me to offer my opinion and to tell you what I think is wrong with the world and what people need to do differently and what they need to, to uh, change But before I do that, I need to make sure I'm holding the mirror up and I'm looking at the mirror of God's Word in my own life uh, before I go start trying to to interject and, and, and fix the world's problems. But also as followers of Jesus, we hold the mirror of God's Word not only up to our personal lives, which we must do first, 
We also must hold the mirror of God's word up to the attitudes and the tendencies and the assumptions of our culture as well. And, and hold those up to God's word. Because culture is always changing. And, and culture will always change and, and adapt. And, and, um, and many of us, we know this. And let's just be real. Sometimes we struggle with that. And that's why it's important that as culture changes, we hold the mirror of this up to culture and evaluate culture in light of this. Now, it doesn't mean we we weaponize this against the culture. It just means we proclaim truth to the culture. Truth never changes. But we must find ways to communicate that truth to the culture around us. As Paul says, I become all things to all people that by all means I might win some. So here's some questions I want to ask us as we we wrap up when we think about acting on God's Word. Here's the first question. Have I truly had a a life-changing encounter with Jesus and His Word? I don't know where you are spiritually today, but... That's the first step that you need to take in response. If you've not placed your faith and trust in Jesus, is having a life-changing encounter with Jesus and His Word. By faith, placing your, uh, your trust in Jesus, in the finished work on the cross, that He secured pay, a payment for our sin. Placing our faith and trust in Him, believing that His death on the cross And His resurrection from the grave was sufficient to pay our sin debt. And as Romans says that with our heart we believe and with our mouth we confess unto salvation that Jesus is Lord. Have I truly had a life-changing encounter with Jesus and His Word? If you've not done that today, then that is your step to respond, your step of obedience towards God's Word today. Number two, am I obeying God's Word to the same degree that I am hearing it? Am I obeying God's Word to the same degree that I am hearing it? Or are we just consuming information without transformation in our lives? Because I know it's so easy for us to come and to hear God's Word taught, God's Word proclaimed. But if it's not changing our lives, we're just consuming information. A whole lot of us we know a lot of useless information about a lot of things in our lives. Rather, for me, I, whether it be the 1970s and early 80s Pittsburgh Steelers, I can tell you all sorts of useless information you probably don't care about knowing. I can tell you all sorts of facts about professional wrestlers that you probably don't care about knowing um, that, that's useless. Um, you probably have all sorts of things you know a lot of useless information about that really doesn't matter. And that's the problem. When it comes to God's Word, if we're just consuming it as information and it's not transforming our lives, it's not accomplishing anything. James says it's useless. So are we obeying God's Word to the same degree that we are hearing it? And the third and last question, what needs to change in my life right now to align with obedience to God's Word so that I'm a doer and not just a hearer of the Word? What needs to change right now in our lives so we can align with obedience to God's Word so that we are not just hearers of the Word, but that we are doers of the Word. Because James says if we're just coming to hear, if we're showing up week after week and we're hearing and we're not being transformed and we're not acting on it, he's saying our faith is useless, that we're deceiving ourselves. And I'm going to be really honest, as I thought about this message this week, in my own life there are so many times that I'm afraid that I fail to act on God's Word. I hear it and I intellectually agree with it, and I know it's right, and I know it's what I should be doing, but I'm failing to allow it to transform my life. And I've been kind of convicted about that in my own life with certain things as I've read. It's like, God, I I know this truth. I believe this truth. But intellectually, it's staying here, and it's not really grabbing hold here. And so I pray today that as we've heard God's Word proclaimed, that we've not just heard it, but we've listened meaning that we're ready to act and we're ready to obey. 
And so I don't know what that looks like for you today, whether it's coming to Jesus for salvation for the very first time, whether it's taking the next step of obedience and baptism or, or co- becoming a covenant partner, or maybe there's some area, other area of obedience in your life that, that you've been hearing God's word and you've been listening. Maybe you need to, to listen to God's word so you can take that step of obedience. But I pray today, whatever that step is for us, that we will respond in repentance and faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for your word that has the ability and the power to transform our hearts and our lives. But God, just hearing it is not enough. We have to listen so that we're ready to act and we're ready to obey. And God, I pray, God, you would forgive me for my failure in my own life to act upon your word when I've heard it proclaimed, when I've listened to your word. God, I pray you would help me to be a doer of the word. I pray for us as a church. God, help us to not just hear the words proclaimed week after week, but God, help us to act upon the words we are listening to that are being proclaimed. God, may your word take root in our hearts and may God, it humble us that we see how broken we truly are and how needful we are today of your mercy and your grace. And God, because of that, may we live as instruments of mercy and grace, as conduits of your love and your mercy and grace towards a world, God, that you desire to see saved. So God, I pray that we will respond today and take that step of obedience. God, whether it be coming down front to gather at this place that's designated to pray, whether it be praying in our seats, whether it be hanging around to talk with someone after the service, God, I pray whatever that looks like for us today, God, help us to respond. Because God, we are called to respond to your word when it is proclaimed. So may we do that today in repentance and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and worship together and let's respond as God has spoken to our hearts today.